Join me in this video as we explore a model for effective strategic coping skills, helping empower you to become resilient as you navigate life's ups and downs and rewire the brain and nervous system over time. Welcome to Root Cause of Happiness. I'm Dr. Sarah Bryn Morrow, licensed psychologist, therapeutic yoga teacher, and optimal wellness educator. I teach the physiology of mental health and the skills to overcome suffering at the root cause. My intention is to empower others to become increasingly resilient by understanding the many pieces of the puzzle to deep healing. Please join me as we explore the root cause of happiness. Let's talk coping skills. It's very common that people come to therapy saying, I have an emotion I don't like and I want that to go away or change. They might be experiencing too much anxiety, too much sadness, even depression, too many angry reactions or feeling overwhelmed with stress. And it turns out that it's very difficult to directly change emotion. Challenge yourself. Imagine trying to become really angry right now just because, on purpose. It's really difficult to do. Emotion really happens to us. We have many ups and downs throughout each day, throughout the human life, and it's impossible to always be calm and happy. So it's very important that we get strategic in understanding how to manage our emotional stress reactions so that our emotions continue to be helpful to us and not become a source of pain or suffering in our lives. Cognitive Behavior Therapy It's probably the most common form of therapy practiced in this modern era. Most mental health professionals now say that they practice cognitive behavior therapy. And I think that it's probably one of the more empowering skill-building approaches to therapy, so it can be very useful at helping clients learn the tools they need so they don't need to be in therapy. I pretty much always share this visual model with my families I work with, this triangle diagram to give us a mental map about where we have choice and how to intervene in the cycle between emotions, thoughts, and behavior. So since we can't directly change emotion, it's very frustrating and even hurtful sometimes when people tell us we should be able to. Very often, especially parents, will say things like, calm down, knock it off, get over it, you're overreacting, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, toughen up. And in these messages, there is a hidden message of shaming us and invalidating our emotions, making us feel like there must be something wrong with me if I can't be calm and happy all the time. But that's simply not the case. Nobody is calm and happy all the time. And we all have to learn how to manage emotional stress and how to build effective coping strategies throughout a lifetime. So how do we do that? Well, in CBT, we learn that emotion is inevitable, but we have choice in thought and behavior. And in our triangle diagram here, we can see that it's true that emotions happen. But how we think, the stream of automatic thought going through the thinking mind, will have an impact on how the emotion unfolds. The emotion does affect our thinking, but our thoughts are where we have choice, not over the emotion itself. Similarly, we have choice in behavior. When we get upset, when a big emotion shows up and we're in that fight-flight stress response, it can drive us to impulsive behavior reactions. Lashing out, panicking, melting down. And we're not really choosing a response. The emotion is kind of bulldozing us and forcing us into behavior that's very much outside of our conscious control. Certainly not typically what we would like to be um, experiencing in our body or in our behavior. So in CBT, we become empowered. We are learning about how to become aware of thoughts, which are often more subconscious, but also we're learning how to be aware of our behavioral habits that are fueling perhaps some of our emotional struggles and difficulties. 
So we're going to break it down. Cognitive skills, behavior skills, giving you today a working model of where you can take control of your emotional patterns and become resilient. So breaking down our CBT model of coping skills, we can think about emotion at the top of that triangle being somewhat out of our hands. Emotion just happens. But where do we have choice? In thought and in behavior. So as we look at thinking skills in therapy, we're talking about cognitive therapy. We're really talking about the skill that we naturally get better at with age, but that we can really exercise and enhance through intentional effort called metacognition. So metacognition is this ability to be able to pause and notice and listen to the thinking mind. Being able to hesitate and just tune in to what your mind came up with in its own automatic stream of thought. Now, the human mind is a pretty interesting place when it comes to thinking. We all have bizarre thoughts, worried thoughts, catastrophic, horrible, gory thoughts. Things pop up into our mind, but typically our thoughts are more like a stream of sort of background noise. Almost as if the thoughts aren't with me, but maybe on a TV in the room behind me. So I'm not really paying attention to that but I could pause and listen and really notice if I wanted to. So our thoughts are always with us. The neuroscientists estimate we have thousands of thoughts per day. Depends how you decide what starts and stops a thought, but somewhere between 6,000 and 60,000 thoughts every day. And those thoughts are largely not really within our conscious awareness. And so what happens is that we have habits that form. Sort of an inner bully voice might become just part of our automatic flow of thinking, being very self-critical. Often we have an anxiety voice, a script, a series of repeated, worried, negative thoughts about what could always go wrong. We often have angry thoughts, judgmental thoughts, feeling that things should or shouldn't be a certain way, good, bad, right, wrong, love it, hate it. You know, our mind can just label and create reaction to things without ourselves really even noticing that our mind is doing that. And so cognitive therapy is this ability to practice, to decide, I need to get to know my thinking mind. I'm going to use emotion as a cue when I go, oh, I feel like upset, stressed, whatever you want to call it. (laughs) And from that awareness of the emotion, tuning into the thinking huh, what is my mind thinking right now that might relate to this emotion that showed up? And maybe I can't change the emotion, but I can change the thought. And so that's a skill we call cognitive restructuring, being able to choose on purpose a new way of thinking. There are many, many different cognitive restructuring techniques. Really, it depends on the situation. It depends what the issue is that you're dealing with. But in general, it's very helpful to recognize when our mind is at war with reality. So just really struggling against just how things are. And realize it would feel better. We would probably be more creative and problem solving, be more resilient getting through an issue if we could have some level of acceptance. So I always teach acceptance as one of the most crucial foundational sort of themes in cognitive restructuring skills choosing your thoughts on purpose. It's also very helpful to work on intentional appreciation. Very often the human mind just isn't really content with things as they are and we always just think maybe the grass is greener or if I only had this then and we really have to start to learn to say hey like things aren't perfect. (laughs) There's improvement progress always to be made in life But what can I see right now to be grateful for? And gratitude really has been shown to improve our mood patterns significantly, really help with overcoming major depressive disorder, and many other areas where it's been shown to just in general make life better for everybody. Other types of cognitive restructuring. We are very unaware often that we spend a lot of our headspace not really in the present moment, but rather in the past or maybe worrying about the future. 
Often if our mind is in the past, it's choosing to dwell on a problem. Something that didn't go our way, maybe an unresolved conflict that we have. And our mind is not focused on the here and now, and so we're creating unnecessary suffering. So one thing we can do is really exercise present moment awareness. This is really the whole field of mindfulness, you know, which is becoming very well respected and supported in modern medicine. Thousands now um, of really high quality research studies showing the incredible health benefits of mindfulness practice. But we can just learn to pause and listen, pause and notice, use emotion as a cue to check in with thoughts. If we do this, we're going to be slowly reshaping the brain. So the brain is very much plastic. It's very much in constant flux, in transition to the next structure based on whatever you're experiencing repeatedly. So whatever we do repeatedly, whether automatically, subconsciously, impulsively, or whether we choose our thoughts, choose our response, choose how we breathe, choose how we hold our face and body in space. These are things we'll talk more about. That choice is giving new learning to the brain, and the actual structure of the brain is changing choice by choice, thought by thought. If you can learn to listen to how your mind thinks and redirect your mind to intentional perspective, before you know it, you are more resilient than you used to be and you don't suffer nearly as long or nearly as intensely. You're finding that your emotional patterns, those ups and downs, are becoming much more manageable. We have so much choice, and cognitive behavioral therapy is one way that we learn a lot of the areas in life in which we can choose the response so that we can suffer less. So when emotion arises, it is helpful to pause and notice thoughts and redirect the mind. But coping thoughts alone will not be sufficient to calming down the nervous system. If you are stuck in a body and a breath that is still in that red zone of fight, flight, stress response. So from emotion, we notice thoughts and we also have to tune into behavior. We have habits in how we behaviorally react to emotional stress. Many things happen without our conscious awareness, such as the way we breathe, but also our posture changes, our facial expression, also perhaps the images that go through our, our imagination. We might withdraw and isolate or externalize by getting upset and lashing out or melting down. So if we're able to pause and notice this impulse, this sudden urge to just behave the emotion, we can recognize that we could choose a response and behavior that is different from what the stress response tends to drive. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, breathing. I will probably have many, many videos about different breathing techniques. But today, I just want to focus on the most important way to breathe, to tell your brain you are safe so that your nervous system can come out of that stress response. So if we are threatened or perceive possible threat, the body again automatically begins to breathe mouth to chest, fast and shallow with an up-down movement. And the diaphragm tends to not move. It tends to be very stationary. So how do we breathe to calm down? The opposite. So instead of mouth to chest, we need to learn to breathe and choose to breathe from nose to belly. That means being able to relax and access movement in the diaphragm muscle. So as we inhale through the nose, the belly can relax and expand outward. And as we exhale, the belly relaxes back as the diaphragm draws up. The lower lungs are the opposite physiology of those upper lungs. The lower lungs have nerve endings that link to that parasympathetic nervous system, the relaxation response. So when we're calm, happy, relaxed, we tend to have a relaxed belly that's moving pretty fluidly as we breathe. We tend to breathe through the nose when we're calm and relaxed. Our breath tends to be nice and rhythmic following a wave formation. 
When we are stressed, our breath can get very fast and choppy and irregular, and it's very shallow. And so one of the very first things we can do is exhale fully. If you're hyperventilating, it can actually be very difficult to breathe in nose to belly and access the diaphragm. So instead, we can exhale the full breath out that draws the diaphragm up. And then my body more instinctively wants to use the diaphragm to guide the next in-breath. So breathing through my nose, diaphragm draws down, belly relaxes gently outward. Now, exhale fully. So we tend to give this cue in our society of take a deep breath to calm down. I think almost everybody has heard that recommendation, and I would say at least half the people that I work with tell me, that doesn't work for me. So what I always want to know is, how are you breathing to calm down? What does take a deep breath mean for you? What's your technique? So usually that's not been taught, and so it's so important that we understand the physiology of the breath and the way that we're breathing communicating back up to the brain, whether or not things are going okay or whether or not we're in a serious problem. So we breathe through the nose, relax the belly, expand, release on each breath, and try to slow the exhale down, focusing on elongating the exhale to help regulate the in-breath. If we can breathe that way almost always quickly within just a couple breaths, we feel our stress response come down several notches and we start to have our head clear a bit where now we can decide what do I do here? How do I handle this problem? So we can breathe intentionally in the opposite way we do when we are in danger. What about the body? Well, that muscle tension is a big deal. And it's very hard to calm down using coping thoughts and breathing if your body is still stuck in tension and restlessness. So one thing you can do is actually go to a mirror. I think it's very helpful and informative in this self-study practice to look at ourselves in the mirror when we're hurting, when we're upset, and try to see how is my actual muscles of my face holding my pain? What can I do here? Can I soften all of those muscles around my eyes, a sense of a gentle, loving gaze? Can I look at myself with a compassionate, loving gaze? Can I have the hint of an energetic lift, a little shift towards a gentle smile? What about my forehead? Where am I wrinkling, right? So to iron out those wrinkles and relax, the whole face tells the brain, I'm safe right now. I have a little problem and I'm kind of upset but I don't need to freak out about it. So we can breathe, we can shift our facial expression, that energy through the face. We can also recognize this self-protective posture and lift through the spine, roll the shoulders back and down, stay open through the heart center, hands down, hands relaxed and open. And then we can breathe more easily into the heart center. So there's little shifts just in posture. Instead of being restless, try to find stillness. If you're chewing on things, your fingernails or a pencil top, put that down and try to relax your jaw. Notice your breath. Okay, so we've worked on breath, we've worked on body. Again, check in with your thoughts, or maybe there's images or something mentally going on. Shift the image in the brain. If you're really struggling, say maybe at bedtime, we can choose imagery work. We can choose to anchor our attention onto a mental image of something peaceful or relaxing or beautiful. So we can relax the breath, the body, and the brain. And then we can also think about our environment. What other choices around me are available? Well, music is good medicine. If you know music that lifts your spirits, helps you find better energy, gives you reassuring messages, Turn to music. Music can be used in a lot of different ways. It can boost our energy when we're really lethargic. It can soothe us and quiet our mind if we're having a hard time sleeping. Usually that's music without lyrics, more instrumental. We can use uplifting spiritual music to help us realign and see things more clearly once more. So music is a wonderful tool. We also might need expression. Right, We might need a chance to take what's going on up here and express it. We can do that in different ways. 
That might mean seeking out somebody that we trust, we can talk to and just vent or kind of tearfully explain where we're at, why we're hurting. Hopefully somebody can hold that space for us. But maybe we don't want to be vulnerable in that way, in which case we can journal, we can write down thoughts and feelings, and it doesn't have to look pretty or have good punctuation. You can just kind of write freely and just express. Sometimes we need to have a little cry. Crying can be very helpful at resetting the stress response balance point. And so crying can help bring us more into physiological balance again. We might be really tired. We're very fragile when we're tired, so possibly rest. We maybe have low blood sugar or we haven't eaten well or have gone too long without food, so a small healthy snack. Choosing to prove to your brain, hey, look, brain, I'm safe. I'm eating, you know, a piece of fruit or a few nuts or seeds, something light, but reassuring my brain, like, I'm not in danger. There's no major threat. I can have a light snack. And actually, just taking in a little bit of food can help stabilize the blood sugar. So there's many, many choices. We might need movement, fresh air, time in nature, distraction. We might need to find something to make us laugh or smile. Even a funny video can be really helpful. There's so many choices. We can always pause, tune into the emotion, give it a label. Okay, I'm feeling anxious right now, or I'm feeling depressed today, whatever that might be. What's my mind doing in automatic thought? Hmm, I think I can shift that and get a better perspective here, remembering the things I could have acceptance or gratitude around. And then what are my choices? How can I actually choose behavior in this day to help things get better, not worse? If we impulsively react to our emotions, we might find ourselves shutting down or lashing out. And instead, we can choose our behavior so that we're proactively taking care of ourselves and giving ourselves the best chance of coming out of that stress response, back to balance, and hopefully teaching the brain a new way of handling stress and different types of problems in life. So we not only handle today's issue much better, but we're learning how to handle tomorrow with even more resilience. We have so much choice, we can suffer less. So there was our breakdown of cognitive behavioral therapy. Keeping in mind this triangle diagram of emotion happening, but from that discomfort of the emotion, noticing thoughts and behavior and choosing response. We have to practice these skills to have them become more effective over time. They won't work immediately. They won't work 100% of the time. But we can start to choose response intentionally during small moments of struggle or even practicing in easy moments just to build familiarity. And over time with that experience, that repetition, we are learning. We are reshaping the brain. We are building skills that will be there when we need them as stress reactions show up inevitably throughout our lifetime. So I love CBT because it's a lot of empowerment in encouraging people to realize how much you can do for yourself. It's very hopeful because it helps us realize that even though emotion can be excruciating and really derail us and make it very difficult to function, we always have some choice if we can bring awareness toward our pain. So we start by saying, I'm feeling this emotion, what's it called? And then choosing thought and behavior that we've been working on, learning how to think differently, be more kind to ourselves, have more compassion choose intentional self-care, think about what does my body need right now? Am I tired or hungry or thirsty or lonely? Or do I just need perhaps a little space from this? Just allow myself to be patient and take some time to process. And if I can do that, I can probably figure out how to problem solve effectively. But we have to have that awareness to interrupt that impulsivity reaction and learn how to slow down enough so that we can be intentional in how we cope. I hope this information was helpful to you today. We're going to keep on going. I have at least a year's worth of content already mapped out, and I so look forward to just keeping this ball rolling. 
offering you all my knowledge for free because I so want to empower you on your path to deep healing. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining me at Root Cause of Happiness. If this information was useful to you, please share it with others seeking knowledge and tools for resilience. It is a meaningful contribution to the world when we become proactive in our healing journeys by learning and growing, by increasing our awareness, by addressing the root cause of happiness. 